And uh, my wife's here with me, and she's right there. 41 years? 41 years we've been together. That is a miracle of God. And only God could do that. And I thank God that he's done it. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, but he's done it. He kept us. It's all right. But it's good to be here tonight to see everything that's been going on. And it's, it's exciting to know. And, and, and this region has always been kind of on the, on, the, uh, on the front line of being innovative and creative and, and pioneering new things. And to see all of these graduates up here and to the discipleship of the next generation and to see all that's happening is, is, is it's very, very special to see because you get that feeling that, that the ministry is in good hands. That, 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 that our young people, our, 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 our now generation are being discipled and trained and, and learning those, those, those things that keep us. Those things that sustain us and those things that see us through for the long haul. Not the quick fix, not the, the flash in the pan, not the, the bright lights and when the lights go off, where'd they go? But no, those things that see young men and young women stand the test of time. And so it's, it's real special to see that happen. So I'm going to ask you tonight, we'll cut to the chase Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. And I just want to thank your new regional pastor, Pastor Miller, for the invitation to come and to share with you tonight. And then also Pastor Al and Sister Georgina, they're a tremendous blessing. And uh, they've always been kind of pioneers. They pioneered the UTC back on the East Coast many, many, many years ago. And there's still fruit from that endeavor. And then to see them here in San Diego and take over and now elders and man, it's 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 exciting journey and to see how God raises young men and young women up to be used in his hands. So first Kings chapter 17, I just want to read one verse right there, verse number one. And I'm reading out of the New Kings James Version. I don't really like it, but it's what we got tonight. And it says, and Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for your presence here. And I pray that you will speak clearly and distinctly to each and every one of our hearts and that, that we would be attentive to what it is you desire to lodge within our spirit. Let that word resonate loud and clear. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Turn to that person next to you and say, and now. Amen. The New King James Version says, says, and it says, and. And the New International Version says, now. And I don't know what version they had up on the screen, but it says now, and it says and. And I want to look at a man tonight. I want to look at a person tonight whom God used powerfully. That I want to look at, at what was it about this man that he was able to, to, to speak the word of the Lord. Thus saith the word of the Lord, and the heavens were closed. What was it about this man that was able just to speak the word, and, and, and the rains came? What was it about this man? What, what, what was it that, that, that was in him that he was able to call fire down from heaven? What did it take and what, 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 what happened through this man that he was able to slay all of the prophets of Baal, the idolatry and the, the sin that was happening in a nation? What was it about this man that, that, that he was able to disciple and to train and to pass off the ministry of, of prophet? in the nation of Israel to a young man named Elisha. And then the culmination of his life was seen that he joined the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Transfiguration. Only one of two, but he's there. 
What was it about this man? What was it that took place within his life? What was it that made him that person and brought about those characteristics and those things in his life? And that's what I want to look at a little bit tonight. What was the secret of Elijah's power? What was the secret of his life that unleashed the power of God through his life that at his word things happened? That at his word change took place? At his word the power of God moved mightily in a nation that desperately needed it. And as you read a little bit of the history of 1 Kings, it tells the story of the spread of idolatry through 13 to 17 that idolatry and sin and rebellion had spread throughout the land. And that there was, there was the, the, uh, the kings, the leaders of the nation brought in all of these idolatrous practices. They allowed these prophets to rise up and to speak false prophecy, to deceive and to, to take a nation in the wrong direction. It's almost depressing to read, to see God's people affected and infected by the idol worship of their kings. It almost feels like as you read, you, it's, like it, it's an end of any possibility and any hope of worship of God Jehovah being revitalized and reestablished in the nation of Israel. But you know, there's a miscalculation. When man has done his worst and finished, that's when God comes and he begins to do his work. You know, F.B. Meyer said in his book that, that not so good for his enemies, but filled with hope and promise for his people. And, and Elijah spoke. And he said, what was it about Elijah that, 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 that turned up the heat? Because there was 7,000 prophets of Baal, that, that, or 7,000 prophets who had not bowed to Baal. But where were they? They were, where, where, where were they? They couldn't be found in Israel. But this one man stood up and he was counted for and he stood and, and represented God. He stood between heaven and earth and proclaimed the message of the gospel. He was thus saith the word of the Lord. The other 7,000, they were paralyzed by fear. They, were, they, they, were, they, they stayed quiet. They never took a public stand. They were silent with fear and they just went with the flow. And that's like many Christians today. You never know they're believers. You never know they're, they're Christians. They've just blended in with society. They never stand out. You, never, you, you, you can never identify them. They just kind of go with the flow and they blend in and they don't want to ruffle nobody's feather. But you see, God's never at a loss. He's always got a man or a woman that is ready to step upon the scene. And to interrupt society. To interrupt the world's way of doing things. And so chapter 16 introduces Ahab and Jezebel. And the Bible says that the wickedness of the land increased. In fact, in verse number 33, it says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who went before him. Now, he was a bad dude and his wife was worse. That's a bad mixture, a bad dude and a wife that's worse. <laughs> but chapter 17 comes and it says, and, or now. Now was the time. Now was the hour. It was zero hour in the history of Israel. It was the time to change things, to move things in a new direction, with new purpose, with a new dynamic, with new power to be unleashed in God's people. See, his introduction reveals several things about his life. You see, his, his name means something. His origin says something about him and his style. You know, in the Old Testament, names take on a significant meaning. And, and they often reveal something of the person's nature, his character, or their personality. And so the name Elijah in Hebrew, Elohim, means God. And, and, and Jah means Jehovah. And the I in there means my or mine. So Elijah means my God is Jehovah. It means that the Lord is my God. 
And so Elijah's name proclaims something about his mission, something about his purpose. And the nation of Israel had never been further away from God. But Elijah comes as a man who stood between heaven and earth and proclaimed the message of the power of God. And he came from, the Bible says there, he came from, from, from he was a Tishbite. He came from Tishba. What the heck is Tishba? You can't even find Tishba on a map. The New King James says it was in Gilead somewhere. But Tishba was a, was a, a, a nowhere place. They didn't know much about Tishba. It was just kind of hard to find. It was, it was an insignificant little place that he came from. It was a place where, 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 where not much happened. It was a place that was desolate, that was lonely, that was out there somewhere. And Elijah was a little rough, rugged. He was kind of, you know, not too polished. He wasn't like real suave. He wasn't real slick. He came and he was rough and gruff and coarse and he got in your face. But that's what God needed at the time. He needed somebody that would stand up. He needed somebody that would say, God is on the scene. He needed needed somebody from Tishba. Kind of like reminds me that he needed, God needed somebody that was called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It's like he needed somebody that was the weak things of the world to confound those things that were mighty. We needed somebody that was able to stand up and declare the power and the name of God in a nation that was godless. And in this day, in this hour, we need a generation of men and women who will stand up and proclaim the name of God and thus say, thus saith the word of the Lord. At my word, no rain. At my word, fire from heaven. At my word, things happen. Why? Because we're plugged in with God. We're connected with God. And the power of God flows through our lives. So his style was unique. Kind of like Victory Outreach's style. He was a kind of in-your-face kind of guy. He was a bottom-line man. And men and women that stand between heaven and earth, that's, that's, their, that's their style. They get to the point. They, they don't take you on a journey. They, they, they tell you what it is and, 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 and what's happening and why. See, one writer says that Elijah was a man without sophistication, that he was without polish, that he didn't have a lot of training. And he didn't have a lot of courtly manners. It doesn't mean that we stay there. But it means that's who God needed to use in this day and this hour. And in this day and this hour, we need some bottom line kind of people. We don't need to dance around with the devil. We don't need to dance around with the philosophies of the, of the world. We don't need to dance around with the religious doctrines that lead people astray. And they talk about, about liberty and freedoms and, and permissiveness and proscruity. And it's all right. No, no, no. We need, we need men and women who will get to the bottom line and call it like it is. Elijah delivers the goods. He, he comes on the scene and he says, no rain except at my word. Why could he proclaim that? Why could he do that? He goes on to say, he says, I stand before God and it's him that I serve. That's where he got his confidence. That's where he got his, his, his power. That's where he got his boldness that he stood with God. He was next to God and he served God. And it gave him a confidence and a boldness to begin to speak. Thus saith the word of the Lord. He didn't have to worry about, well, I hope it's right. You know, I, you know say a false prophet, man, if, you don't, if it doesn't come to pass, you're going to get stoned. Not the kind of stone we think about. You see, in our day and our hour, God's still looking for people who will make a difference. He's still looking for young people that were like on this platform this evening that will make a difference, that will be accountable, that will make a change. He's not looking for a people that are mediocre, not looking for a people that blend into the background. 
Sometimes you got to look long and hard to find someone who will stand for God. Because the flavor of our day is tolerance and compromise. That's the flavor of the world. It's the flavor of the religious world. Tolerance and compromise. Being politically correct. Not wanting to offend anybody. Not wanting to hurt anybody's feelings. See, there's a difference from offending and being offensive. God hasn't called us to be offensive, but he's called us to stand and proclaim the truth and the power of God. And if it offends somebody, praise God. God's big enough to deal with that. You see, Elijah's life teaches us what the Lord requires, what, is, what the Lord's looking for. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 says, I searched for a man among them. I, I searched for a woman from among them who would stand up and build the wall. Somebody who would stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. What a sad commentary. But I thank God that Victory Outreach, we're, 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 we're not like that. We got men and women who will stand between heaven and earth and declare the word of the Lord. See, God looks for a man or a woman at difficult times. God needed a person to shine in the darkness of the day, not in the palace, not in the court, not in the school of the prophets, not in the places of business as usual, but no, somebody that had some clout, somebody that was in the closet of prayer and had commitment and sacrifice, somebody that was willing to stand up and say, this is what God says. Somebody from the UTC, somebody from the MTC, somebody from Victory Outreach Churches that's got some backbone and stuffing in their life that isn't going to compromise, that isn't going to tolerate things, and is going to stand up and say, thus saith the word of the Lord. We don't need no mealy mouth, wimp outs. And the thing is, he found this man in Tishba. I can't get away from Tishba. If you're going to Israel next month, hey, go to Tishba. Try to find it. They say there's a statue there of Elijah. But Tishba, I, I, I can't get over that Tishba thing. You know what it's like? It's like, where did God find you? In Tishba. He found you in some neighborhood somewhere. He found you in some obscure place. He found you in some obscure detail of your life. He found, he found me, he found you, he found us in the most unusual places that you would think to look for somebody that would stand up for God. You know, you could have, he didn't want nobody that was weak. He wanted somebody that was tough, that was rugged, that had been through some stuff. He needed somebody from, from Tishba, somebody that, 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 that was, was from the beach community. Like Huntington Beach. Somebody's got to do it, man. I said, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go. Somebody from the neighborhood. Somebody from the barrio. Somebody, somebody, from, somebody from the street corner slinging that stuff. Somebody, some, somebody out in the desert somewhere. One of those gila monsters or horny toes or snakes or whatever those things are. Somebody from Tishba. If you're from Tishba, you're a candidate tonight. Somebody with some backbone from Tishba. You can't do nothing in Tishba, but get backbone. You've been through some stuff. You've seen some things. You've stood the test. You've faced adversity. You know what tough times are. We need churches today that will stand. We need churches that come from Tishba, that are willing to stand and face adversity and go through the things. Churches that will stand up and say, that's wrong, that's not right, that is sin, and that will result in eternity in hell. Churches that will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and say, God is God. And people in those churches who aren't afraid to stand and do battle with the enemy. See, we live in a day and an hour of, of, of desperation. We live in a time 
where God needs people. God needs men and women who will stand for the things of God. Not be like the 7,000 that were just kind of in the woodwork. Not like the 7,000 that just stayed silent and went with the flow. Not the 7,000 who were just there when the lights came on. Not just the 7,000 who were there when, when it didn't count. But the 7,000 were, were hiding. God needs men who, and women who will stand alone if need be. Men and women who will stand tall, stand firm, stand strong. No wimps. No cha-chas. No dropouts. No fallouts. No wimp outs. We need all out. See, we're talking about a unique situation here. We're talking about a unique individual who was willing to stand. And you see, you know, God's not surprised. God looked back and, and he looked ahead and he saw in 1967 that he was going to need a man, that he was going to need a woman to go into the inner cities of the world and proclaim the message of thus saith the word of the Lord to bring hope, to bring promise, to bring destiny to a people that were lost. They say Pastor Sonny came from New York, but it was a Tishba in New York. Sister Julie came from Tishba in East L.A. Well, I don't know what neighborhood, but she came from Tishba. And see, when you come from Tishba, you got a head start. You can stand. See, churches that come from Tishba, they don't, they don't, they don't go with the fads. They don't go with the, 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 the doctrines of the day. They don't go with the theology of the day. They don't buy into a, 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 a Calvinistic perspective on salvation that once you're saved, you're always saved. No, but you can lose your salvation. You can take your hand, yourself out of the hand of God. You can lose that salvation. But there's many, many theologians out there that are teaching something contrary to that. They say that we're so depraved, we're so sinful that we can't even think straight. So God had to predestine us to get saved. And then he had to predestine some to be damned. That don't sound like the God I know. He said, whomsoever will, let him come. He said, God for so loved the world. Not the predestined of the world. He said the world. We got these doctrines to compromise and, and to be tolerant and to, and to leave room for whatever happens, happens. Whatever you want to do, do. Let me ask you a question tonight. How's your character and your integrity? What's our testimony look like? Let me, ask, let, me, let me ask you another question. What do people say about you? What's their commentary about your life? You know, do we compromise our values and our principles to kind of be in the in crowd? Do we, do we compromise those things just so we can get where we want to go? You know, there's some churches that compromise those things. And they do things that they think are going to get them a crowd. But you can't mobilize a crowd. They just show up and then they leave. But see, we compromise values and principles just so we can be with who we want to be with. We, we lose that sense of conviction within our life because of what we want to do and not what God wants to do. Can I ask you another question? I like to ask questions. Does behavior and language still irritate you when you hear it? Not like prudish and, ooh, they said a bad word. Not like that. Oh, oh, look, there's the devil. The devil. 
No, but this, this, this behavior, does those, do those things, those words, and you hear people, you know, cussing and talking and doing all that stuff, does it irritate you or is it just, oh, yeah, well, that's the spirit of the world, praise God. Doesn't it irritate you? Doesn't it bug you, man? It, it bothers me. I hear that stuff and I go, man, God, you got to do something, God. Something's got to happen. Something's got to take place. Something's got to wait. You look at the news and you see the garbage that's going on in our world and in our country and in our city and in our county. And you go, God, you got to come. God, we need men. God, we need women who are going to stand up and not compromise our character, not compromise our integrity just to be in the in crowd. Just not to look like we're one of them Christian folks. One of them happy, clappy, beard wearing, toga wearing, sandal walking. No, but to be somebody that stands for God. Where do you stand tonight? Who do you stand for tonight? Oh, you know what? I better ask another question. Can I ask another question? How you doing morally? Because we live in a society where anything goes. I mean anything. How's, how's our morality in this day and this hour? What do we look like? Have we compromised, again, those values and those principles and our morality is dependent upon convenience or loneliness or just simply the flesh. Not where we're, we don't want to be perceived as prudish, so we compromise certain things. We compromise our morality because we don't want to look like we're weird or we're out of touch with society. We want to look like we're contemporary that we got to touch, that we understand the world and we know what they're up against. And so we begin to compromise those things. Well, I become all things and I might win some to Christ. But how do we look? How do we look morally? What about churches? You know, churches tolerate certain things within their church. They tolerate this, 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 this spirit of the world, this, this, this morality and immorality for the sake of convenience and understanding people are lonely and everybody needs somebody and God's got a rib for you and you know you just got to go find it however you can find it solve the loneliness of your flesh I, you know I, I, it's like where do we get all that stuff how do we how did we how do we fall into that trap how does, how does the church and Christendom and the kingdom of God, how, how, how do they get caught up in all of those things? Where are the men? Where are the women that will stand for God? Where are the men and women? Where are the churches that will declare, thus saith the word of the Lord? Where are the Elijahs of today? See, God's methods are surprising. You never know what he's going to do. God didn't raise up an army. He didn't send some noble or prince or king or whatever to impress everybody. He, 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 he chose an Elijah, somebody unusual, somebody not normal, somebody from Tishba. <laughs> somebody that dared to make a difference. Somebody that had realized what he had been saved from. Somebody that realized that, that growing up in Tishba was just the beginning and not an end. That growing up in Tishba opened doors before him, that made a way before him, that God was able to reach down and grab a hold. And Elijah never forgot where he came from. He was, he, he was different. He was unique. He wasn't normal. Victory Outreach, we're not normal. People look at you and me, they look at us and they say, wow, them people are weird. Well, if we're weird, let's be weird. Let's be different. Be different in your city. Stir things up, shake things up. 
be a, be, a, be a man, be a woman, be a church that stands on the edge, that stands on the front line, that's not normal, that's different, that will proclaim, that will stand, that will speak, that will declare. And now, Elijah spoke. And now, Victory Outreach spoke. And now, San Diego Victory Outreach spoke. And now, Vista spoke. And now, Hacienda Heights spoke. And now, Escondido said, Thus saith the word of the Lord. And then, I don't, you know, El Cajon might as well be Tishba. And then El, El Cajon stood up and said, Thus saith the word of the Lord. It sounds illogical. It doesn't make any sense. When did anything that God did with you and me make sense? When is five loaves and two fish make sense? Where does 12 disciples and one a traitor make sense? That's going to change the world. When does a religious Pharisee, a zealot, travel in the country, killing Christians, when does that make sense? That he's going to lead a revolution in the world. See, what God does doesn't make sense. Looking at you doesn't make sense. Looking at me, well, yeah, I can understand. But looking at you don't make sense. Man, you don't even come from Tishba. You come from a suburb of Tishba. Well, it doesn't make sense. Using somebody like me. When I first came around, some of you heard me say it, it was brown, browner, and brownest. <laughs> no se habla espanol, homie. It wasn't normal. This bottle of milk in the midst of iced tea didn't make any sense. But I don't know, 43 years later, hello, doesn't make any sense. I know I look like the cop or the banker or the FBI or... Just as long as I don't look like Trump, that's it, praise God. <laughs> when does it make any sense? Does it make any sense? You look at the most qualified candidate and God says, no, 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 not him. Him. God, are you sure? I'm sure him. David wasn't even considered in the menu. They had even forgot about him. But Samuel said, isn't there somebody else? And David showed up and he says, he's the man. He's the one. What about you? An unlikely candidate. You don't feel adequate. You don't feel capable. You don't feel like you got what it takes. You don't feel like, you feel, man, I'm just kind of on the fringe. I'm just kind of here, and I don't understand a lot of things, and I don't know what's going on. That's who God's looking for. He's not looking for proud and arrogant and gotten it all together and got the answers and the Bible answer man and can do this, that, and the other thing and, you know, can juggle plates and juggle balls and, and dance at the same time. He's not looking for those kind of people. He's looking for people that are dependent upon him to move through their lives and let his power be exhibited for the world to see that it's different. It's unusual. It's not the same. It's not business as usual. Sometimes, man, Victory, we, we, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. Could you imagine if we were all like all that stuff? I know we got folks that are like that, but you've been radicalized. We got folks that have come from, you know, Tishba, but uptown Tishba. And that's cool. But you've been radicalized. You got the spirit of Tishba in you. 
You got the spirit of victory outreach in you. You got a little radical in you. You got a little, come on, let's go. You got a little, thus saith the word of the Lord in you. After all, what do we got to lose? See, God's looking for you, for me, for people like us. The most unlikely person, the most unlikely candidate, the most unusual one. Now, don't go out and be all weird. No. I'm unusual, God. Look at me. Here I am. You know. Don't develop a twitch or an itch or a... I'm unusual, God. But he's looking for the unique, the original. Somebody that will be who God has created them to be. With no pretense. With no guile. With no, 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 no ungodly ambition. Somebody that is humble and pure before God. Whose motives are right. Whose desire is the Lord. How can we stand alone for God? How do, we, how do we take that posture? How do we stand alone for God? What is it, what is it that, that, that is about God that, that when he comes calling and when he comes looking for somebody, what, 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 what's he going to find in Victory Outreach? What's he going to find in the, the pioneer generation? What's he going to find in the now generation? What's he going to find in the next generation? When he comes looking, when he comes calling, what will he find? Will he find in us a ready and a willingness to stand for him? Will he find a willingness to say, yes, God, here am I, send me? Will he find a heart that is completely his? Will he find the kind of commitment that he can use in the dark, desperate hours of the world in which we live? We're, 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 we're accelerating toward the second coming. And the days are going to become dark. The days are going to become evil. But what, 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 will he find somebody that will stand and declare, thus saith the word of the Lord? Will he find churches that won't compromise? Will he find churches that won't follow false teaching? Will he find churches that are willing to stand up? And be different and be persecuted if need be. To go through stuff if need be. But yet they stand their ground and they say, yes, God, I stand for you. Let come what may, but I stand for you. This is what the Lord says. This is what God says. And now, victory outreach. And now, victory outreach. At my word, things happen. At my word, God moves. At my word, the heavens are closed. At my word, fire comes from heaven. At my word. You see, if our Christianity hasn't been put to those kinds of tests, if our Christianity doesn't have that kind of steel in our backbone, if our Christianity doesn't have something of that of that grit, of that determination, of that, of that spirit inside of us, then there's something, something terribly wrong. There's something wrong. You know, thank God we got UTC, MTC, ABC, <laughs> FYG. Thank God we got all those things. But see, if it doesn't produce the backbone, if it doesn't produce the convictions, if it doesn't produce a life that is not going to compromise, that is not going to accept immorality, is not going to violate the values and the principles, the discipling that takes place instills values and principles and brings accountability and commitment and sacrifice. And those are the things that sustain us. Those are the things that keep us. Those are the things that propel us forward. Those are the things that make it happen. And if those things aren't there, something's wrong. One of two things is happening. Either the message that you've been hearing doesn't put steel in your backbone. 
Either the things that you're studying and looking at aren't putting that kind of that kind of grit in your heart. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. But I know in this region, that ain't happening. So it has to be the other thing. It has to be something in your heart. It has to be something missing in your heart that hasn't surrendered completely to God. Something in our heart that, 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 that hasn't been changed and sifted and, 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 and turned toward God. Something in our heart that wants to hang on to something. Something in our heart that wants, that wants a little taste. Something in our, in our heart that says, one last time. Something in our heart that says, ooh, well, the grass is pretty green over there. Hallelujah. And our heart is not completely his. I wonder, where's our heart tonight? God's looking for men and women whose hearts are completely his. You see, Elijah knew his God. But more importantly, his God knew Elijah. Where's your heart tonight? Who's got it? Who's holding it? Is it he? Is it she? Or is it God? Is it the affections of the world? That the ambitions of the world, who's got your heart? Who's, who's got, does, does the money have it? Ain't nothing wrong with money. But if it's got your heart, then you're loving it. And that's the problem. Who's got your heart tonight? Where's it at? Whose hand is it in? Stand with me tonight. Just every head bowed and every eye closed. Just limit the moving around. Because I believe God's saying something tonight. I believe God's speaking to people, to a generation, to generations. Because us pioneers, we're not done yet. The best is yet to come. It's like you ain't seen nothing yet. The next, the now, the new, the never, whoever. God's looking for a heart that is completely his. Where's your heart tonight? Who's got it? Whose hand is it in? Father, I pray tonight, here in this room, from front to back and side to side, that the power of your spirit move and hover over the face of the deep. Let your spirit hover there, God. Awaiting your word. Awaiting the word that speaks light and life into every circumstance and every situation. At your word, things happen. At your word, a creative process is unleashed that, that shapes us, that forms us, that fashions us to be the people you've called us to be. Let our heart be surrendered to you tonight, that we are completely yours. From all over this room tonight, we need the spirit and the power of Elijah. Victory Outreach, we need that spirit. Not just the men's home, not just the women's home, but Victory Outreach, we need that spirit. If we're to sustain and to continue to move this vision forward, we need that kind of spirit. We need that kind of heart. So from all over this room, I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you way back there. I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to let God put something inside of you. To let God capture your hearts tonight. 
to let God get a hold of us tonight in a new way, in a new dynamic, with a new power to be unleashed within our lives. I want you to come. You that are willing to stand. You that are willing to say, at my word, thus saith the Lord.